how do we use, uh, sorry, what do we use to maintain the status quo? All right, that's today's question, and I uh, hope you're having a great day so far. Welcome to my channel. My name is Thomas, and I do educational videos on uh, many different topics. Most of them are kind of the things that you learn in school, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, well, not so much writing. Uh, re uh, actually, not so much reading either. Uh, a few different things about reading, but arithmetic, geometry, physics and chemistry, economics, uh, health and fitness, um, and also music, um, philosophy, spirituality, meditation, uh, many other subjects, or at least a few other subjects in addition to that. Uh, I try to tackle these things from a more quantum perspective or more foundational perspective, um, getting down to the nuts and bolts of what, you, what we're actually dealing with here. Uh, and so uh, you have to kind of unlearn some things that you, maybe you learned in school um, in order to really access a lot of the teachings. Uh, some of it is pretty difficult. And so as a result, we're looking uh, for the first uh, unit of this uh, channel, we're going to uh, look at the tree of life. We've been looking at the tree of life. I find the tree of life to be a fantastic model and it's really helped me. Um, and that's why I'm spreading it to you. Um, the reason why I teach it first is because it lays the foundation uh, for you to be able to learn the other subjects. So the other subjects, like I said, some of them are kind of challenging and it really helps to have kind of a, uh, it's kind of like a net, you, you know, uh, you, if you throw, throw something off the cliff or whatever, uh, off the ledge, uh, it's good to have a net to fall into and, uh, you know, that's very helpful kind of when you're jumping out into the unknown to have uh, something that you know is going to, uh, you know, if you're on the trapeze or you're, you're on the high wire, um, you know, you can, you can trust your balance and try to keep balancing. But if you fall, it's good to have a net to fall back on. And that's, I think, the tree of life in a great, to a great extent is like a fallback where um, it helps you to... Um, integrate all the things that you've learned. It helps you to, um, to categorize, to, to uh, prioritize, and to make decisions. And then it also helps you to, you know, just to learn the things in the first place because it gives you kind of the, the uh, fundamental structure that everything else fits on. Um, it's been called the mystical filing cabinet. And I think that's very true that it, uh, it serves to organize and uh, keep you organized, keep your head organized. Because some of the times you can be learning so much stuff that you just feel swamped. But you don't have to feel swamped if you have the tree of life because it will just kind of, uh, if you've memorized and you really understand or overstand the tree of life, uh, understand the tree of life, then you will be able to have that fallback so that if you just can't really uh, fit anymore, you can't really uh, grasp anymore, the tree of life will kind of, um, it'll keep you going. Okay, so this is what the tree of life looks like. It's an ancient diagram. It goes back to at least ancient Egypt, and it is um, also being used by uh, ancient Hebrews and modern Hebrews. Uh, modern Christians use it, but mostly it's being used by occultists at this point. Uh, some of them are quite evil, uh, including uh, the person who talked about the uh, mystical filing cabinet, who's Aleister Crowley. Uh, there's a lot of Satanists that use uh, the Tree of Life, and um, they use it against us. Uh, but it's not the Tree of Life that's evil. The Tree of Life is really, you, you know, it's a defense mechanism against them. If you understand the enemy's um, tactics, methods, then you can more effectively defend yourself against them. Plus, 
if you have good intentions, you can use the tree of life uh, in that way, in, in, a, in a good manner also. Uh, you know. So, the tree of life has 10 different circles connected by 22 different lines. Uh, the 10 different circles are numbered as are the lines, but we're not going to get into the lines. Uh, the Tree of Life actually kind of de-emphasizes the lines as opposed to like the Hebrew version. Uh, but anyway, we've got, um, and that's especially when you have this here. So the 10th sphere, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, circles or spheres. And then we have uh, the what is called the abyss, which is an implied sphere here, which uh, kind of fills in for these lines in the tree of life. And then we also have a zero above the tree, uh, which makes a total of 12 different categories, or really 12 different aspects of our consciousness, 12 different abilities of our consciousness. So the tree of life itself is really a map of our consciousness. And if we can kind of understand how each 12, each of the 12 work and how they work together and that we get a really good grasp of it, how they're connected, we really learn the diagram well, then uh, we can eventually get the tree of life to kind of download into our, into our memory and um, we make it old hat. And so we, we can really learn to use it well. Now, quickly, I'm going to try to go over all 10 of these uh, spheres and the two others in order to uh, give you the background. Uh, 10 spheres really are survival, uh, our instinct, our wild animal consciousness. This is our life force. Uh, this is kill or be killed, uh, state of nature, fight or flight response, all those things. And we can, we can destroy our life force through defilements and lusts of the body that also occur here. So this really... It refers a lot to the body, uh, but it's really our life force and our survival instinct. So our, the lowest aspect of our life force. Okay, the ninth sphere, where the tenth sphere is like our uh, wild animal consciousness. The ninth sphere is more like our domesticated animal consciousness. So this is what we get growing up in the home. The first few years of our lives, we're highly receptive. We're receptive to our environment. Uh, everything is new and different, and we're soaking it up like a sponge, but particularly things that uh, our caregivers are, are doing. So we watch them intently, and we learn to imitate what they, what they do, their behaviors and their, their motions, and then we practice that imitation till we get it, till we get it right. So that's, uh, the night sphere is for the, uh, higher, is the highest really state of learning that we can get. Uh, receptivity, heightened receptivity, along with um, imitation, memorization, uh, and practice. Okay, the night sphere is not discerning, so it will copy, mimic any kind of behavior, regardless of its morality or lack thereof. Okay, then we have the A sphere. If the night sphere is our domestic sphere, the A sphere is our public sphere, or you could call it, uh, our persona, our masks that we wear, but also uh, it is really, it's our faculty of our belief systems and our rational faculty. But this is, uh, this is where the consensus worldview comes from. This is where all the institutions are located, the establishment is located, all the resources are located here. Um, and uh, it's kind of run by the powers that be, and they appoint experts to disseminate their opinions about how things really are and how we should behave and how we should think. And to the extent that we copy them, we can uh, fit into the A-sphere and eventually become like junior members of the A-sphere. Uh, but... Uh, what they tell us is true is not necessarily the truth. It is if it's convenient for them, but if not, they will twist the truth. Um, and they will um, give you a half-truth or a partial truth um, or an outright lie. 
you know, depending on what's convenient for them. And, but we still have to kind of buy into it to really get accepted here. So we end up using uh, fallacies of our logical uh, faculties in order to accept what's here, such as rationalization, which is what we'll be talking about today, where we um, more or less uh, come up with excuses to justify the lies that they're telling here, uh, which are contradictory to our own feelings and experiences and perceptions. So, um, you know, we will, we will deny our own experience in favor of what they say is true because they present themselves as a consensus. So it's like, everybody knows that. What, are you an idiot? Can't you see this? You know, they will, they'll pressure you to, um, you know, to accept their, their beliefs and make you feel like you're completely marginalized if you don't. Um, but then, you know, uh, they'll call you a conspiracy theorist, but then uh, six months later, it'll come out that you're, tr you're telling the truth and they will, you know, they'll just move on to the next lie. You know, they won't even, they won't apologize, they won't correct the record, they'll just, you know, move on to the next one. Um, and that's really kind of been the pattern of history and science all the way through, where people have actually called them out, then been ridiculed, burnt at the stake, exiled from their country, and or something to that effect, um, symbolically or physically, and then later on it comes out that they were right. <laughs> so, um, anyway... Now, but if we keep our rational faculties intact, uh, we're going to end up moving on to the seventh sphere because we recognize that the eighth sphere is just like the third of the 12 faculties that we have. We got to keep moving on to the other faculties. If we, you know, kind of twist our logic uh, to make it seem the way they portray it as the A sphere is the be all and end all, and this is the measure of your success, and this is the goal of your life, then um, we will be stuck in the A sphere, and we will never get to see the rest of the, our potential develop. So when we move on to the seventh sphere, uh, we do so because we smell the rat about the A sphere. Something was wrong. And we moved over here, and this is where the A sphere is the real world, the seventh sphere is the imaginary world. So we imagined a better world than what we're seeing here. We saw, okay, this is an injustice, this is a problem, this is something that I, this is a lie, and so I imagined something better. I, um, and then there's many other faculties of the seventh sphere, including uh, so in, imagination, but also inspiration. We maybe we saw someone do the same thing or similar before us, and so we're kind of inspired or motivated to do the same ourselves. We also have our intuition, which is our ability to really ask questions inside uh, of ourselves and be able to wait for the answer, and then being able to actually verify the answer because sometimes we can mistranslate it. We also have our creative spark here, or it's our ability to uh, you know, assemble things in new uh, configurations, and also our pleasure principle to assemble them in, in pleasing configurations. And then at the top, and the culmination of the, of the seventh sphere, is really to tune into our um, mission in life, or our higher calling, um, Instead of uh, this kind of cog in the machine, the eighth sphere wants you to be a cog in their machine. Whether you, you, know, you want to be a politician, you want to be a banker, you want to be a doctor. Um, here you are at the seventh sphere, your higher calling is you. It's you as an individual and how you can contribute best to the world um, you know, with the particular skills and affinities that you have. So, you know, you're, you're, you're getting out of this cog in the machine mentality and recognizing that you have something individual that you bring to the table and you try to cultivate that. And your attention to try to cultivate that is what causes you to move up the tree. 
So you move up to the sixth sphere, and this is really where our essence and our center is, or I would call it our outer core. And the outer core is our free will faculty, our ability to pay attention and to make decisions. So free will boils down to making decisions and paying attention. Now, when we're paying attention, before we kind of uh, exert our free will, we are generally stuck paying attention to the eighth and ninth spheres, which is the status quo, which is what we're used to, what we're accustomed to. And so we um, are paying attention to that. But now that we have our, we recognize our decision-making ability, we can avert our attention from these lower aspects and point our attention in the direction of our higher uh, spiritual evolution, which takes great courage and motivation because uh, instead of, you know, kind of looking at the, uh, at the comfortable, we are now staring into the unknown because these aspects, these higher aspects, we haven't really accessed them. We haven't opened them up yet. We may have a glimmer of them, but we really, we're really looking into the unknown, which is a scary proposition. Now, the first thing that we want to pay attention to after we make that, that, that transformation is uh, the fifth sphere, the next sphere in line, which is our uh, sense of justice. You know, this is our sense of what's right and wrong, our sense of what's fair and unfair. And uh, this is also known as karma, too, because you can... Uh, envision like a mirror right here and karma is cause and effect what comes around goes around as you sow so shall you reap and for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction you know you act and you get a reaction so karma grades itself or grades you based on violence waste and violation so if you violate somebody You'll, you'll get violated in return. If you do violence unto somebody, you will get violence in return. But, and so, you know, if you don't understand your karma, you can see yourself as being a victim. Oh, I always have such bad luck. Well, no, it's not luck. You created it through your own, uh, um, you know, not optimal action. And so if you're paying attention, though, you notice these things and you can begin to clean up your own behavior and that will begin to clean up your own karma. And eventually you will be, you know, basically karma is not here to punish us. It's here to protect us. So if we actually observe the laws, karma is the enforcement of the laws. If we observe the laws, then we are immune to any type of bad action coming toward us. Now, it can be complicated because of reincarnation and we have past lives, but we can eventually live down our past lives, and so we're just dealing with, with this life. It's a long process. And so uh, now the enforcement of the law here is at five, but four is the articulation of the law. And this is what we really need to be able to understand, again, pay attention to, so that we can clean up our karma because we don't really know what the criteria are. Violence, waste, and violation is a good start. But we, we can get into the details and the weeds here at the four sphere, which is the articulation of the law done by the ancient holy books and the cosmologies and the theories of everything, some of them are ancient, some of them are modern. Uh, all of them have something to say about everything. You know, where did we come from? Uh, who is God? What is our relationship with God? Uh, you know, how are, what is our relationship with nature? How do we fit in? Uh, where are the laws? What are the laws of the universe, um, both physical and moral? And uh, these kinds of things are all articulated in a cosmology. That doesn't mean that every, they got everything right. Cosmologies need to be adjusted from time to time to adjust to new findings. Um, and that's why a lot of new cosmologies are around as well. 
the syncretic approach is the recommended approach where you study really as many of these different cosmologies as you can, compare and contrast, and then intuit. You go inside again. Once you've done the studying, once you've done the heavy lifting, you go inside and you ask, you know, how do I, how do I make sense of all this? How do I sift through all these different things and come up with something that makes sense to me? Okay, then we go to the... Th uh, the abyss here. This is our psychic powers. This is our ability to tune into and recognize omens. Uh, the omen is a uh, coincidence, a synchronicity, something that bucks uh, the trends of statistics. And we have to notice that as being some kind of important communication that we're getting. Also within the omen is going to be a, co a course of action. We take, if we take that action, uh, then we will be responding to the omen. The, respond, uh, the noticing of the omen is called psychic receptivity. The acting upon the omen is called psychic heat. Okay, then three, two, and one at the top of the tree are our um, divine faculties within. And we've got omnipotence, all-powerful, omniscience, all-knowing, and omnipresence, all everywhere, all at once, eternally. We tap into this through sound, uh, sound synch synchronized sound, particularly mantra, the letters of the alphabet, which open up our powers. The, th the omnipotence really comes into play as being, uh, being able to do anything, but in particular, uh, anything humanly possible. But in particular, being able to fulfill our uh, higher calling that we declared here at the seventh sphere. So this is really the culmination of all that work. And then we've got the, uh, the second sphere, which is about um, omniscience or wisdom. This is our ability to solve problems and to avoid our own problems and to uh, propose solutions to others. We can tap into this either, either through a divination system like Tarot or I Ching or through our own actions of meditation and being able to cut off our, our thoughts so that we're able to sink into the core of the mind or at least see into the core of the mind. Uh, whereas the A sphere, we're, we're, we come up with solutions, they always have unforeseen consequences. Uh, but here, the solutions are final, we solve the problem. But it's, it's a great discipline to be able to do that uh, sufficiently with the mind. Uh, with the meditation. Okay, then we, what we see when we see through the mind is we see the core of the mind, the, um, our deepest center, which is the first sphere, omnipresence. It's everywhere all at once. Once we sink into our deepest center, we recognize that what's at our center is the same as what's at everybody else's center. And it's the same that it's at every, every center. It's the center of everything. And it is... Um, a unifying factor because we see that we're all equal. The zero sphere is above the tree. It corresponds to um, nothingness and mystery. It is not part of the universe. So it's, it's, not, it's not on the tree, it's above the tree. Not part of the universe, but it is part of the creator. So the creator has an aspect of its existence that is not part of the universe, and that's what it is. We only have it. indirect access to it. So that is the kind of summary of the tree. Now, to go a di another level from the 12, you've got the 12 here, but you can shrink down the 12 and apply it to each sphere. So you break the 12, uh, each one of the 12, into its 12 for a total of 144. I call those the different uh, fractal faculties or minor aspects or stages of life history, cosmology, uh, and spirituality. And uh, I've compiled those into a guide that I'd be happy to share with you. If you'd like to click the link in the description, uh, I'll send that out to you for free. It serves as a good backdrop for the, uh, these, uh, the rest of all these videos. Uh, so I'm doing 144 separate videos on each one of the minor faculties. Today we're looking at number 27. What do we use to maintain the status quo? And number, uh, number 27 is in the A sphere. So this is about our rational faculty and our belief systems. And it is the, actually the eighth fractal of the A sphere. 
So it's really kind of the, the heart of the A-sphere or the, you know, um, I guess, you know, the essence of the A-sphere. It's not really the, the center of uh, uh, kind of the meaning of the A-sphere. And so number 27 is called rationalization. Stage 27 is about fooling ourselves into accepting the status quo through the contortion of our rat rational faculties. Twisted beliefs to justify current behavior. We convince ourselves we have valid excuses when we only have ready-made excuses. Bend logic. So the normal and the status quo get the benefits of the doubt. Justify the lies of the powers that be. Succumb to the power of consensus. When they tell us the emperor has no clothes, we have to ignore our own perceptions to believe it. But because we are scared to buck the trend, which is contradictory to our own experience, everyone can see that the emperor is wearing no clothes. But almost everyone is scared to state the obvious. Sometimes it takes a beginner's mind so instead, we learn to hallucinate a beautiful suit of clothes. We worship our own victimhood, our own helplessness to change the situation with the Almighty, I'm sad, the Exalted, I'm hungry, the Most High, I'm tired, the Majestic, I'm bored. And the omnipotent, I'm afraid. The everlasting, it's impossible. The eminent, that's impossible. And the divine, I can't do that. We worship and follow these, these rationalizations, these deities in quotes, and believe in them. So when they show up as thoughts, we accept them, and these entities enter our heads and quickly take over, often after only one repetition. But if not, we will repeat rationalizations until believed. The gods with a small g are shape-shifting into young, unsuspecting minds and affecting our behavior. Beliefs fulfill themselves and convince us to conspire against ourselves. Flimsy excuses like, the ref sucked, my body's craving it, so I have to listen to my body. We gotta have a big breakfast for energy. Double cheeseburgers, cause we gotta get our protein or we'll feel really weak. The brain is made out of fat. So I need to gorge on it. A little dark chocolate and ice cream are good for you, but fruit isn't because it has too much sugar. Beer and wine are good in moderation, of course, which allows me to have about a six pack a night. Right, bartender? I'm catching a cold. I'm catching a virus. I have an allergy. Or is it our sad diets? No, it's congenital. It's coincidental. I'm sorry, but I got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning and I have to take it out on someone. Flimsy excuses. Sound silly, don't they? Sound silly. Smell a rat. Doesn't pass the smell test? Sniff out a rationalization and stop it before we start to believe in it. We're identifying ourselves with our persona, making excuses to save face. But really, we're not saving face. We're saving our masks. A 
Okay, that is the eighth fractal of the A-sphere, number 27, rationalization. And uh, there'll be plenty more to say about that in this course later. But thank you for sticking around for the whole video. I appreciate that. You can click the like button. Uh, you can also share uh, the video with others, subscribe to the channel. You can uh, make constructive comments in the comment section. Click the link in the description to get the free copy of the Guide to the 144 Fractal Faculties. And you can also um, donate directly to me through Cash App and Venmo uh, listed in the description. Um, I'll be doing another video tomorrow on a different one of the 144 fractal faculties along with a different introduction on the same topic. And uh, until then, hope you have a great day and hope to see you back.